Senator Tom Cotton. Senator Cotton, we are delighted to have you with us. Hey, John, it's good to be on with you. Hey, Senator, let's start with foreign policy. Um, first of all, as a member of the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee and a recognized foreign policy expert, what do you think of uh, President Trump's uh, foreign policy moves uh, so far in his administration? John, I think over the last three months, but especially over the last two weeks, the president has moved uh, in the direction of Ronald Reagan's old uh, strategy of peace through strength uh, for too many years. Uh, through budget cuts to our military and also through weakness and appeasement of our adversaries abroad. Um, our friend and foes alike question America's credibility uh, and our commitment to maintaining uh, a stable world order to protect our interests. But with airstrikes in Syria to punish Bashar al-Assad and his outlaw regime for using chemical weapons on a battlefield where American troops are present, and now uh, by repositioning carrier strike groups off the coast of North Korea and making it clear to North Korea and China that we will not tolerate a... Uh, North Korea that can hold American citizens at risk with nuclear weapons. Uh, the president has turned the tables on our foes and reassured our friends uh, and is defending our most basic core security interests. Now, North Korea seems to be the crisis of the moment. Uh, what do you think is going to happen next? Are we going to see a decisive resolution here or a standoff? Or what do you think is going to happen? Well, John, in the transition, President Obama cautioned Donald Trump that North Korea would probably be his most uh, immediate crisis, and I agree. Uh, North Korea has been testing nuclear weapons for 11 years now. They've been testing ballistic missiles of various kinds for much longer, and if they can match those two technologies together, they can hold at risk millions of our citizens and uh, troops and our allies in the Far East, and one day in the not-too-distant future could perhaps strike the continental United States. Uh, for three presidencies, President Clinton, President Bush, President Obama, our policy has essentially been to kick the can down the road. Uh, we can't do that anymore because we're running out of road uh, to kick the can down. So I think President Trump has made it clear uh, that we cannot accept a Kim regime with intercontinental ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads and that we have to take all necessary steps to stop that. Hopefully we can uh, work with China and make them realize that it's in their interest to peacefully denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. But one way or another, uh, we're going to uh, have to ensure that North Korea cannot uh, use nuclear weapons to hold at risk the United States. Now, you just mentioned China. Uh, North Korea is referred to as a rogue state, you know, but usually rogue states aren't entirely rogue. Usually they've got patrons. And, of course, What's really kept uh, the Kim dynasty in business, I think, is is the support of the Chinese. There have been news reports that maybe President Trump has made some kind of a deal with China. Uh, what do you think? Do you think we'll get their cooperation at this point? China's for, for a long time played a double game with the United States, saying that, yes, they, too, wish that North Korea wouldn't behave in the way it does and that they'd like to help, but not really do anything to help. You know, recently they made an ostentatious show of cutting off coal imports from North Korea, uh, but that was largely symbolic. Uh, North Korea still gets 90% of its economic activity outside of its borders with China, so China could bring much greater pressure to bear. President Trump realizes this. He said as much in public um, that every aspect of our relationship with China is on the table, and if China wants better trade terms for the United States, they're going to help, have to help us solve the nuclear problem in North Korea. That's something that President Obama never did, and frankly, for a long time, too few presidents have done is to see every issue of our bilateral relationship with China as interrelated. And if China doesn't want to help us with the most critical issue we face in East Asia, which is uh, North Korea's nuclear and missile technology, then they're going to have to suffer consequences on other parts of our relationship. Like, for instance, deploying missile defense systems to South Korea, which they strongly oppose. If China would work with us more in North Korea, then we wouldn't have to take some of the steps that we have taken to defend ourselves and defend our troops and defend our allies. So I, I think the president has the right approach here, and, and I hope that the Chinese leadership recognizes the critical urgency of this problem. I don't think it was a coincidence, after all, that President Trump launched those airstrikes against Syria while he was having dessert with Xi Jinping. <laughs> no, I think that's exactly right. Now, North Korea tried to launch this latest missile, uh, you know, the day after, I believe, they had this big celebration of, of the of the Kim dynasty, and, and it blew up five seconds after launch, and it's been widely speculated that we destroyed that missile using cyber warfare. Uh, can you confirm that, Senator, or is that, does that remain in the realm of speculation? 
John, I, I have no comment on that. <laughs> okay. Well, I, you know, I think most of us found that fairly reassuring, and assuming that that was in fact something we were able to do, um, does that buy us some time? Are, are we able to negate uh, the North Korean threat at least to some degree with cyber warfare, or does it remain urgent? John, I would say this about missile testing, and we see this in the United States as well. Uh, too often, the media asks, was a missile test a success or a failure? Um, and that's not the right way to look at it, whether it's our missile testing or North Korea's. The way you look at it is, what did we learn? So, so even if a missile explodes on the launch pad, explodes a few seconds after launch, misses its target, um, the missile engineers can still learn quite a bit. So every time North Korea conducts a test, even if it looks like an apparent failure, they continue to learn more about the missile technology that they need to develop to reach the United States with a nuclear warhead. That's one reason why the the fuse is burning uh, on this problem and why President Obama told President Trump that it would be the most immediate challenge he faces. Now, it seems to me, Senator, that North Korea is like Syria and also like ISIS, you know, where we, where we bombed them in uh, Afghanistan. And, and they're alike in the, in the sense that they are leftover problems from the Obama administration, that President Obama just never took serious action to deal with. Some people are accusing uh, President Trump of being a flip-flopper, but it seems to me that what he's doing is moving to clean up some some messes that were bequeathed to him by his predecessor. Is that a fair assessment, or do you think I'm being too hard on uh, President Obama? No, that, uh, that's a fair assessment, John. You know, as the president frequently says, the world is a mess, uh, and more chaotic than ever, and uh, he inherited that mess from Barack Obama. There's no doubt about that. I would defy you to point to a single country in the world, uh, friend or foe, where we have a a better relationship or in a stronger position uh, than we were in 2009 when Barack Obama took office. And I would say on most of these measures, uh, he's not reversed himself. Uh, He's identifying changed behavior, for example, in NATO with more countries moving towards their 2% goal, or new circumstances, Bashar al-Assad using chemical weapons once again, um, or in North Korea, the accelerating pace of missile tests. Um, that's what we would expect any commander-in-chief to do as he faces new challenges once he comes to office. Uh, but there's no doubt that our relationships around the world were in worse shape in 2017 when President Trump took office than they were in 2009 when President Obama took office. I want to shift gears a little bit and move to another trouble spot, which in the long run is probably uh, worse than North Korea, and that's Iran. You were maybe the most vocal opponent of the Obama administration's Iran deal. Where does that stand today? My, my concern is that Iran has pretty much gotten what they wanted from the deal, which is something like $100 billion in cash and relief from sanctions with a bunch of new uh, business deals going forward with the Europeans. Is it too late to withdraw from that deal, or what do you think we should be doing there? Well, John, you're, you're right that... The nature of that agreement was structured so Iran got most of the benefits up front. It got all of its assets unfrozen. It got cash payments and, you know, large unmarked bills from the Obama administration, um, and sanctions were lifted. Many of those steps are irreversible. We can't go in there and get those Swiss francs and euros back. Um, However, we can take further steps, not only to enforce the deal to the letter, but also to impose additional sanctions on Iran for its ballistic missiles tests, its support for terrorism, its support uh, for re- uh, uh, insurgencies throughout the region, and its campaign of imperial aggression. One of the fundamental problems of the nuclear deal was not just on the technical details of how we monitor this side or how we test that side. It was the fact that it uh, decoupled Iran's nuclear program from its uh, behavior in the Middle East like its support for terrorism and its campaign of aggression against our allies. Uh, We can put pressure on Iran on on those issues, consistent with the nuclear deal itself. Then it's up to the Ayatollahs whether they continue to enforce or whether they continue to uphold their end of the bargain. And if they don't, well, they'll have to pay consequences for that as well. I want to shift gears a little bit, Senator, and talk about a couple of domestic uh, issues. One of them are the, is the, the dueling scandals that we've seen emerging in Washington in recent months. Uh, on the Democrat side, uh, you have the claim that um, the Trump campaign may have colluded with the Russians to uh, try to influence the presidential election in 2016. 
And then the flip side of that, we have the emerging uh, scandal over whether the Trump or the, whether the Obama administration uh, was spying on the Trump campaign. And Susan Rice has come to the fore. You've referred to her as the typhoid Mary of the Obama administration, always popping up where things are are going awry. Both of those so-called scandals have been have been kind of quiet now for a while. What, what's going on there? John, one reason why the review of these matters seems quiet is it happens in the Senate Intelligence Committee, on which I sit, and the materials we're reviewing are inherently classified, so, some at the highest levels of classification in our government. Um, but I can assure you that our uh, review is uh, continuing. You know, I've been to the intelligence agencies. I've reviewed all of the source material uh, behind uh, that first set of issues, which is uh, Russia's activities to interfere in our electoral process. Our staff, while we're in our, back home with our voters uh, during this Easter recess, are conducting interviews and moving forward. The second set of issues you mentioned uh, about the uh, kind of wild-eyed, hair-on-fire allegations of collusion between Donald Trump associates and Russian intelligence is something we're going to look into. I, I would say, though, that people who are in a position to know and who have no reason to uh, defend Donald Trump have said there's nothing there. You know, people like Jim Clapper, the director of national intelligence under Barack Obama, and Michael Morrell, the deputy director of the CIA under Barack Obama. Um, and then the third set of issues, um, which is potential mishandling and even illegal uh, handling of classified information by Barack Obama officials, probably White House and Department of Justice officials, uh, related to uh, Donald Trump and his campaign and his transition. I would say that's the one area where we know a crime has been committed. Uh, we don't know how it was committed, but we know it was committed because of the leaks about Michael Flynn and his conversations with the Russian ambassador. Those are very se- uh, That's a very serious uh, crime, and it's something that I hope the FBI gets to the bottom of, and certainly something that we will be reviewing as we move forward because the American people need to have confidence that the intelligence community uh, and the political appointees who consume intelligence in our government are not mishandling that kind of information. So as a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, you're personally involved in these investigations. Uh, uh, what, what sort of timeline should we be expecting here? I think a lot of us get frustrated that, that these issues seem to be left hanging indefinitely. Um, how, how, how much time is going to go by before we finally get some kind of resolution? I don't know, John, if we can put a timeline on it yet. I will say this, though, that that first set of issues related to Russia's interference in our electoral process uh, is distinct, and it's, there's a relatively finite amount of information, you know, of raw intelligence on which those conclusions are based. And people in the intelligence community who reviewed that intelligence and wrote the report that was released to the public in January. Um, so I, I believe that set of issues uh, can be addressed at an earlier time than the other two sets. Uh, the allegations of collusion between Donald Trump associates and Russia, and finally, uh, potential mishandling of classified information by the Obama administration. So it's possible we might release some kind of interim report. Um, I hope that we can move as quickly as we can to make as many of our conclusions as public as we can, uh, and even make the information on which we base those conclusions public. Again, this is a very sensitive area because it involves some of the most highly classified uh, information that our government has. Uh, but the work is going forward. Uh, and it's going to continue. And this is the way it would be under any set of circumstances, John. You know, the Democrats keep demanding a special committee of Congress, which we already have in the Intelligence Committee, or an independent commission. But even if you had those things, uh, they would be doing their work exactly like we are. Secure, compartmentalized information facility, you know, with uh, very limited uh, numbers of, uh, or copies of these documents handled by a very small number of people. That's just inherent in the nature of this work. A lot of us conservatives have been frustrated by the slow pace of confirmation of uh, President Trump's uh, appointees to various various departments. But obviously one notable success is getting Neil Gorsuch confirmed to the Supreme Court through the use of the uh, Harry Reid option to uh, uh, negate the, uh, the filibuster. Uh, I wonder if you can comment on that. What I've wondered about that, Senator, is was was that always a done deal, or was it something where there was a real serious risk that the nomination might fail because some moderate Republicans might refuse to go along with the Harry Reid option? Uh, John, I don't think it was a done deal at all. Um, I just would say that you know we 
President Trump, uh, throughout the campaign, made promises about the kind of nominee he would appoint from a list that he made public. He did just that. Uh, so credit goes to him, and credit goes to Mitch McConnell, who for over a year, uh, you know, acted decisively in the uh, hours after Justice Scalia's untimely passing to say that the American people would make this decision. No matter how much criticism he took from the left and from the media, he stood firm on that principled stance. And then he held together 52 Republicans on something that wasn't foreordained at all um, to say that we're not going to allow the Democrats to establish a rule where Democratic nominees always get an up or down vote and Republican nominees don't. It's just that simple. Um, so this is not something that was foreordained. It, it took a lot of work and leadership and the credit goes to Donald Trump and to Mitch McConnell uh, for the fact that Neil Gorsuch sat on the Supreme Court yesterday for the first time. Yeah, I agree with you. That was uh, Mitch McConnell's finest hour, and it's wonderful to have uh, a Justice Gorsuch uh, confirmed and listening to uh, oral arguments. Senator Tom Cotton, we have to run to a break now, but thank you very much for uh, for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, John. Good to be on with you. And we'll be back after this.